Hello, and welcome to week 14 of Computer Science 225, the final week of this class. This week, we're going to finish up talking about shell scripts. Now, a couple weeks ago, we introduced the idea of a shell script, and we saw that it is essentially sort of like a program. It's a text file in which we give to an interpreter, but in this case, the interpreter is the bash shell. And so everything that we put into that script, into that file, are run as commands, just as if you type them out manually yourself on the shell. These are great ways of automating things and saving time and avoiding having to do uh, more work than you have to, essentially. So last time we looked at variables and how to do things like take the arguments into the script, how to do math, how to get input, how to basically chain up the commands and things like that. This week we're going to learn more of like the sort of like programming elements of bash scripting. We'll look at how to do if statements and conditionals and loops and functions. And so we'll be able to do slightly more complicated things, slightly more complex scripts. Uh, if you haven't realized, this is basically like learning another programming language, uh, but it's one in which is really helpful and worth your time to learn because if you're doing things on the command line, you'll quickly find that some aspects of your command line use are sort of things that you have to do all the time or things that maybe are a little bit repetitive, and that's where shell scripts come in because you can automate all of those things away. So let's pull up a terminal, and we'll start talking about how we can use shell scripts uh, to do slightly more complicated things. And I think we'll start off talking about if statements. All right, so to start off with, I have this sort of simple script that is using the ideas that we talked about last time. To quickly review, we have this first line, which is a comment, but it's a special type of comment called a shebang, which uh, indicates the interpreter or the shell that should be used to run the script. And in this case, it's bin bash, which is the bash shell. Then we have this script set up so that it can make a backup of all of the files or directories that get passed into the script as arguments. So we're using this dollar star to indicate all of the arguments which are passed into the script. We are using as the name of the backup file that gets produced as backup dash and then we have this bit of code inside of this string constant. And remember, when we use the double quotes for string constants, there's this interpolation thing that happens. And the dollar sign parentheses is used to basically like run a command and get whatever the output of it is and then put it back as a string. So this says, run the date command where the format is year, month, day. So it'll produce like 2023-4-12 uh, for today. And so the whole name of the file name will be like based off whatever date it is, essentially. So it'll be like backup, followed by the date, followed by .tar.gz. Then we have a couple of echo commands, which are like print statements. We just print that we're backing things up. Then we run the tar command. And as the first argument, we give it the file to make the backup of. And that's whatever um, string we just computed, essentially. And then as the things to put into the tar file, we use dollar star, like everything that gets passed in. Then we have another echo at the end that just says we're all done. So if we remember, we can run this in multiple ways, but probably the simplest is to just pass it to the bash command as an argument. And then let me see what things I have here. I can back up, oops, <laughs> back Emin, uh, bash backup.sh. I can back up, let's say, um, this project one directory and let's say the backup.sh script itself. So if we run this, um, there was a git thing in uh, there, so it produced a whole bunch of files. All of them got put in. And so we have our first print statement that says backing up. And then it put all of project one in there. And then it also put backup.sh in there. And then it gives us our last print up, printout saying all done backing up. If I clear to the screen and then do a listing, you can see that it made this backup file. And um, one helpful thing that you might know is that you can open up tar.gz files in Vim and it will show you all the files that are in there. You can see this tar.jz has all the stuff inside of there. So our backup script seems to be working. One thing that we might want to fix about it, though, is it doesn't really work super well if we forget to pass in any arguments to it. So if I just run bash backup.sh, it gives us this. It says backing up. And then when we don't pass any arguments, then the dollar sign star is an empty string. 
And when you give tar an empty string, it doesn't have anything to put into the tar ball. It doesn't have anything to put into the tar GZ. And so tar has this kind of funny message, cowardly refusing to create empty archive. Try tar-help or tar-usage for more information. And then it says all done backing up, which is not actually accurate, right? Because we forgot to tell it to back anything up. And so what we might want to do if we're working on a script like this is we might want to check and see if the user passed anything in as dollar star or if they did not. And so this is our first use case where we like find that having something like an if statement in a script would be good. We would want to say, hey, if they passed something in to the script, put it into the backup file. If they didn't, maybe give them a more friendly error message than all of this, which is confusing to say the least. So how do we do that? Well, in bash, just like most other languages, we can make an if statement with the keyword if. Then, unlike most other programming languages, instead of parentheses here, it is square brackets. And the square brackets will contain the condition, which we'll talk about in a second. Then we have, instead of curly braces or indentation, we have this, which separates out the, uh, the body of the if statement, the part that we do if the if condition is true. So instead of curly braces or something like that, we have then, which says to begin the if block. And then sort of confusingly, the if block is ended with the word fee, which is if backwards, which is kind of weird. That's just how Bash does it. Uh, you start an if block with if, and you end an if block with if backwards fee. Uh, just a little bit of a peculiar thing to get used to. Like Java, the indentation doesn't really matter. I indent over because I think that looks cleaner, but it doesn't actually, Bash doesn't actually care if you indent or not, but I will because I think it looks better. So the conditions then, when we come back up here and we want to put our condition in, well, what we need to check in this case isn't necessarily the dollar star, but probably dollar pound. If we remember, dollar pound is the number of arguments that we are given. And then, it would be probably more familiar to all of us if we use things like this, like if dollar pound, which is our number of arguments, is greater than something or is less than something. But these don't actually really work in Bash because these are our output and input redirection operators. If you remember back from when we talked about this, we can use this greater than sign and less than sign to like take the output of one command and shove it into a file or take a file uh, text contents and pass it into the into a command as its input. And so these are not used for comparing less thans or greater thans. In this case, if we want to see if the number of arguments is greater than a certain amount, we would say dash gt. That is how we do greater than in bash. And so we want to do this backing up process if there's at least one argument which is passed in. And so we can do that by saying if the dollar number, if the number of arguments is greater than zero, then do this backup code. And so now if we don't pass an argument, nothing should happen because all of these commands are inside of this if block here. So let's run it and see if that is what is happening. I should be able to do now bash backup.sh. And if I run it just like this, nothing happens. It doesn't give me all of these error messages because I didn't pass it any arguments. If I do pass it some arguments, like let's say maybe I make a backup of my bin directory, then it should go ahead and actually do it. Bash also has an else. So if I want an else block, then I would put it before the fee. And then it looks like this. Now the else block is between the word else and the word fee. So between the then and the else is what happens when the condition is true. And then between the else and the fee is what happens when the condition is false. So in this case, I can maybe give them a more helpful message that says, like, um, uh, please pass the files slash directories you wish to, I'm typing very poorly today, back up, something like that. And now when the condition is not true, when they haven't passed any arguments, it should give us that message instead, which is what we can see happens. One thing about Bash is that it is quite picky when it comes to indentation, or not indentation really, but rather spacing. So if you do this command like this, it is not going to be 
none too happy with you if we try and run it again. Backup.sh, bracket zero command not found. Bash is uh, quite picky when it comes to the spacing. Like I said, the indentation of the lines it doesn't care about, so these can be all over here if we want to. As awful as this looks, Bash is actually fine with this, but the spacing around the brackets it is super picky about, and so we have to make sure that we do a good job um, remembering to put spaces on either sides of these bracket things here. Another thing about Bash is that we um, it's very it's very loose when it comes to variables. So let me let me start another program inside of here uh, to show you this. Let's see um, if we want to check perhaps if the argument is equal to something in particular. So let's say we can say if bracket space remember the space dollar one our first argument is equal if we're doing. Um, if we're doing equality for strings, then we would use just a single equal sign like this. The, the, the ones for numbers are um, dash gt, which we saw for greater than, dash lt for less than, dash eek for equals, any for not equals, less than or equals, greater than or equals. These are all on the notes page for, for this week, but uh, these are sort of the numeric comparisons. The um, comparisons you do if you're comparing just general strings would be either equals or not equals like this. So if we can say something like, if dollar one, the first argument is equal to apple, then we can say, echo you passed in apple. Then we can say like else, uh, echo you passed in something else. So if we run this script, when we pass in apple, it should give us the first statement here. If we pass in anything else, it should give us the second statement here. So I probably should have renamed this to something else, but it's still called backup.sh. So if we do backup.sh and run it with apple, we get you pass in apple. If we pass in anything else, it will say you passed in anything else. But what happens if we pass in nothing at all? We will get an error. This error is very confusing, I think, to people new to Bash. It says uh, equals here, unary operator expected. Also notice that when you have an error, Bash sort of continues on trying to do the rest of the script. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bail out necessarily when it sees the first error message. So it still says this you passed in something else um, message. It doesn't terminate the script when you get to, to this, this error line here. So what does this error mean? It says unary operator expected. Well, if you didn't pass in anything for $1 like this, then $1 is essentially substituted with an empty string. And so when Bash goes to evaluate this line, this if statement line here, it will substitute the $1 with what it's equal to, which at the current place is an empty string. And so it actually sees the code like this. It sees if nothing equals apple, and it thinks, well, what is nothing? Like, I can't compare apple to nothing. That's what it is saying when it says unary operator expected, because there's only one argument that it can see to this equals operator, and it needs two. It's not a unary operator. So uh, there's a few things about this. One is that the sort of mindset of bash scripting is different than programming in a more rigorous programming language like Python or Java. In those languages, all of the variables you have have types, and all of them will have values. Even if the value is null in Java or none in Python, it's still sort of like has a value, and it still is treated as a variable. Bash scripting is a lot more sort of loosey-goosey with things like variables and types. And so uh, this, is, this is just a thing, it's sort of like a mindset difference to the way that they work and the way that they're designed. But in this particular case, the way that we would fix this would be putting quotations around this. Because then when it does the substitution and it substitutes $1 with nothing, it's left with this. And it says, if the empty string is equal to apple, which makes sense and it's able to parse this, and it will say, no, the empty string is not equal to an apple, but at least it doesn't see it as is nothing at all equal to Apple, which produces that error. So if we write it like this, it will no longer give us this error message. Now the if condition evaluates to false, bringing us down to the else block. 
and even if we pass in nothing here, this will still be sort of recognized as a string at least. We can also sort of explicitly test if a variable exists or not. That's done using a unary operator. And so some of the things that can go inside of our um, if conditions here are binary operators like this, like are these two things equal or is it one less than the other? And we can also put in various unary operators, which only sort of do one test on one thing. And so one of them is dash n. And we can do the dash n test on a variable like $1, our first argument. And what dash n says is it says, does the string have non-zero length? So does the string exist? Dash n is like a variable existence check. And so in this case, we can say something like, you passed something in. And then it will go on with the rest of the script and check if it was Apple or not. And so if we run this uh, by doing bash backup.sh, if I don't pass anything in, then the dash n test fails because this $1 variable does not exist. If I were to do, um, well, I guess I can do this first. If I actually do pass something in, like if I actually do pass something in, like the bin directory, then it will say you pass something in. The opposite of this is dash z. Dash z says, like, is this variable zero length? Does this variable not exist? And then we can say inside of here, oops, um, you did not pass anything. One thing we could do is we can combine these into, instead of just an if and then a separate if else, we can combine it into an if, else if kind of chain, just like we would do in Python or Java. And so what we can do for this is I would get rid of the fee here closing this one off. And then this if I would turn into an elif. So now we have if the variable doesn't exist, then we say you do not pass anything. Otherwise, we go on and say, is the variable equal to apple? If so, then we say we passed in apple. Otherwise, we pass in something else. And now, because these are linked, they should be sort of um, only one of them should, should occur. They should be mutually exclusive. And now, if I run this, I would say bash backup uh, dot sh. And if I run it with nothing, it should say we didn't pass anything. If I type in apple, it will say you passed in apple. If I pass in anything else, it should say you passed in something else. And so this sort of demonstrates the if, else if, and else things in bash. Now, there's other sorts of um, tests we can do, and they're on the notes. So we can test if a file exists or if the file is writable or if the file is executable, we can sort of do sort of tests on files as well. So we can test sort of if there are files in the, in the given directory or not. So for instance, let's say we want to test like if the user has a .vimrc file, we could do that with a test like this. We would say if, and then we would put in another one of these unary operators and the one to see if a file just exists is dash e. So we can say if dash e um, dollar home slash dot vimrc as our file name for the test. And if this is true, then we would have oops, the then, and then we would say echo you have a vimrc. And then we could put the fee right here. I guess I can put an else. Else we'll say you don't have a vimrc. And so here. This sort of demonstrates that if I were to run this one, I don't know, what am I, why do I keep putting this in there? Um, uh, if I run this one for me, I think it will say I do have a vimrc. If I was to remove it or move it, let me move it for now. I'll put it as just vc for now. If I run it now, it'll say you don't have a vimrc. So we can use this to sort of check and see if a file exists. And there's other ones. You can look them up on the notes page to check if files are uh, readable or writable or executable, things like that. So that is sort of our coverage of if statements. So our next topic is shifting arguments. So to see what this is, what shifting arguments is, let me open up another file. I'll just call it something in there, generic, like script.sh. And I'll put in, oops, the 
shebang line. And then what we'll do is we'll echo dollar one and then call shift and then echo dollar one again. And let's do it a couple more times. Let me, let me do it a bunch more times. So now we do echo the first argument and then we do shift. Then we do echo the first argument and then shift, echo the first argument and then shift. And so what we'll see is that shift essentially like moves the arguments down the line. So if I was to run this script file and I can say something like, uh, hello there, bash is fun, something like this. What this does is it prints hello there, bash, which is kind of weird if you look at the way this is written because I'm printing the same variable every time. I print dollar one and then I print dollar one again and then dollar one a third time. But what shift does, this command, it tends to come up a lot in shell scripting, is it says take my arguments and sort of like shift them all down one. So what was dollar three becomes dollar two, what was dollar two becomes dollar one, what was dollar one becomes dollar zero, and what was dollar zero gets just like put off the face of the earth. It sort of rotates everything down by one in terms of the argument numbers. And uh, this is just something that ends up being pretty useful inside of these scripts. If I was to look at our backup script again, let me uh, real quick put it back the way it was. Okay, there it is, I uh, copy, copied it back. So here we have our backup script again, where we have our if else statement now to see if the user actually passed something in. We might evolve the script even more to put in sort of some options into the script. So, for instance, we might have an option to uh, make the script go into quiet mode where it sort of um, does it without giving us any sort of user feedback or user interaction. We can make a variable for this. And so what we can do is we can make a variable called, let's say, quiet for quiet mode. And let's say the default is not to go into quiet mode. So I'll set it to zero. Bash is untyped, so doing zero like this or doing zero like this is the same thing. Everything is basically treated as a string, a string type always. So I tend to just sort of reflect that by putting uh, quote, quotes in there, but you can do it either way. So then what we'll do is we'll say, did the user pass in the dash Q flag to us? The Bash commands that we've seen already, like copy and vim and rm and uh, bash itself and ps and all these commands we've been learning take arguments and options. When we're making scripts, we can make them take our own options as well. So I can say if the first argument, quote dollar one like this, is equal to dash q, like that, then we'll say quiet mode is true, and I'll set quiet equal to one. Bash also does not have any sort of Boolean type. Uh, it doesn't really even have an integer type per se. It, everything is typed as strings, like I said. So here I have zero for quiet mode and one for, or rather zero means we're not in quiet mode and one means we are in quiet mode. But you can say yes or no or T or F or whatever you like really, as long as you keep it straight. So here, if dash Q is passed, then we go into quiet mode. Then we can do things like this, where we can say, if, uh, let's say, dollar, uh, put it in quotes just to be safe, if dollar quiet is equal to one, no, is equal to zero. So if we're not in quiet mode, then I want to say, all right, then I want to have this little message here. Actually, you know, I can just put this whole thing probably inside of this block. And then I can say else, and then close the if block. And then what we'll do is we'll put this tar command in here, and we'll take off the v flag. The v flag for tar is verbose mode. And so if we want to really be quiet mode, then we'll use just this command. We won't print our echoes saying, we're backing up, and hey, all things are backed up now. And when we are in, uh, non-quiet mode, we'll also pass the verbose flag. When we're in quiet mode, we'll just do it without the verbose flag and nothing should be printed. And so, so far this all seems like a really good idea. But if I try and run this, we'll see that it won't work entirely quite right. If I do bash backup.sh 
and let's make a backup of, let's say, our script.sh file. Then non-quiet mode, regular mode still works fine. It says backing up. This is the output from tar. This is the thing that I actually put into the tarball. And it says all done backing up. But if I pass, if I try to pass our dash q option here, we'll get an error message saying tar invalid option dash q. And so what's happening in the script now is that this dollar one that I passed in, the dash q is going to tar as well. So as part of the dollar star, this is getting sucked into, I guess it would actually be this one, this is getting sucked into the tar commands. And so we're saying tar, make this backup, and then dash q, and then whatever files we actually passed. And so we don't want this dash q to be part of the command line stuff any longer. And so what I can do with that is I can do shift. This is a really common thing after you've sort of dealt with your uh, sort of initial arguments or flags, we can use the shift right here, which will say shift off the dash q. So now dollar star should just refer to all the things that are left on the command line. So in this case, when I, when I have this, this is my dollar star to begin with. When I do the shift and get rid of the dash q, then this is what dollar star is equal to. And so now if I try it again, it should work. And you can see that it made the backup.tar.gz file. Uh, and it did it just quietly. So that is uh, what the, the shift command does. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you some of the scripts that I use day to day. And you'll see that I use shift actually uh, in a few of them because it is super helpful. All right, next we'll talk about loops. Bash has two types of loops. Let me go into a different file for this one. Bash has two different types of loops. It has while loops and it has for loops. I think for loops are probably more widely used and more useful. Um, but it has while loops as well. Um, here's a program. Let me just copy and paste it from the notes for today that shows us what we can do with while loops. This is a program to compute factorials. If you remember, a factorial is a number times by every number less than itself down to 1. So like 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 all the way down. And so we can do this math sort of thing with a shell script. I would probably recommend using a sort of more rigorous programming language for doing like math calculations like this. But we can do it in Bash. It sort of shows off how while loops work. They're uh, pretty, uh, pretty simple, really. So we are getting a variable read in with the read command. We looked at this two weeks ago. And so our first variable is n, which is read in from the user. That's the number that we wish to compute the factorial of. Then we set the factorial to 1. This is creating a variable. Then we have the while loop. The syntax for it is the same as it is for an if statement, essentially. We have the word while followed by a bracket. Spaces on either side of the bracket. Don't forget that. Then our condition inside of this. And here we have $n greater than 1. We could optionally have put this inside of quotes. But here, it won't really matter because the read command will definitely put something in for n. I guess if they just hit enter right away, maybe it wouldn't be. Uh, so maybe we can put quotes around that. Really, either way is fine. Then we do two math expressions. We multiply n into the factorial. So we set fact equal to. And again, the double, the dollar double parenthesis says do a math expression inside of here. And so we take whatever fact is currently times by n. So if it was like um, five uh, is our is our factorial number, then we say fact is equal to fact times five. Then we subtract one from n. So the first time through, n will be five, and then it will be four, and then it will be three, and we sort of multiply all those together into this variable, and then we print this out at the end. So if I run this script, script.sh, it asks me for the value. And if I put in 6, it'll give me 720. So this shows how while loops work in Bash. All right, so like I said, I don't think while loops probably come up as often in Bash scripting, at least not for me, as for loops do. So let's look at for loops. The for loop is similar to the Python for loop or to the Java sort of new for each style loop in that you can like loop through a collection of things and do something on each thing. So one place this is often, often used is in something like this. 
for each file in our list of arguments, do, and then let's say um, do something with dollar file, and then done. So both the, uh, I didn't really talk about this, but both the while loop and the for loop use these do and done markers to demark where the loop body is. So if uses then and fee, while loops and for loops both use do and done to mark the beginning and the end of the loop. The indentation again is meaningless, but just like in Java, I would always put it in there because it looks better and makes them easier to read. So this says for each file in dollar star, this thing here on the right side of the in is some string containing multiple words. And what this does is it sort of is like a string dot split thing where it will break up the words into uh, single variables, assign each one into the variable file, and then it will do the loop body for each one of these. And so if you want to like loop through all of your arguments, this is basically how you do it. So if I say bash on script.sh with no arguments, it doesn't do anything. But if I say hello there from a bash script, it will loop through and apply the loop body to each word that I give it inside of this argument list here. So if you have something where you want to like do a process on a bunch of files, this is how you do it. It's an interesting for loop because you would think that it would work on like an array or a list, but that's not really how bash works. Bash Re represents these by basically lists with spaces on them. So if I make a list of months and I have January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December as my list of months, and I want to loop through and do something for each month, I wouldn't do it by making like an array or a list. Instead, I would make a string where they're separated by spaces. And I would say for each month in dollar months, do this now. And I would say echo the month is dollar month, something like that. So it looks maybe when you see code like this, it looks maybe more more sophisticated than it really is. It's not actually really doing anything with a data structure. It's just looping through the words in a string, essentially. And so if I run this, it should do this little for loop body for each of the months in this single string. It basically just goes through them uh, word by word, essentially, is what it's doing. If you do need a for loop that goes like through a range of numbers or something, you can use this funny command seek. The seek command is a command, okay, really all these commands you can just run on the command line directly. But the seek command is, oops, uh, let me start over. It's a funny command in that it gives you a list of things. Uh, really, really, uh, I, should, I should probably have said that the bash for loop doesn't necessarily go through something separated by spaces, but rather white space. So if you have new lines between things too, it'll loop through them just as well. And so what seek does is it gives you a list of numbers between a range and it separates them with new lines. It's sort of like the Python range function if you've done Python before. So we can do seek of 10 and it will give us the numbers one through 10. We do seek of 200, it'll give us the numbers 1 through 200. We can give it multiple numbers, like I can say like 10 through 15, and then it will give me from 10 to 15. I can also give it three numbers. Again, it's very similar to the Python range. I can give it 100, negative 2, 80. And then it will give me from 100 to 80, going down by negative 2. Or I could give it seek from one going up by, let's say, zero, going up by fives to 25. So it starts at the starting point. The middle one is how much you go up or down by. And then this third one is the ending point. That if, is if there's three things. If there's two things, it gives you just from the first to the second, inclusive, so like fifth, uh, 30 to 40. And if you give it just one thing, it gives you from one to that number. So if we want it to, we can use this in our shell scripts. I can open up my script.sh 
And if I want to just do something a certain number of times, like I guess I can really do the same one, I can use dollar seek, oops, dollar parentheses seek of 12. And then we can say it is the dollar month month, something like that. And now this dollar seek, remember to the dollar parens is going to say run this command inside of these parentheses and then expand to that text. So now this will expand to the string containing the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, separated by new lines. The for loop loops through things separated by white space, and so it'll apply month to 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then run this for loop body on each of them. So if you want a script for whatever reason that just does something a fixed number of times, this is how you can do it. So that's the for loop. Like I said, the most useful one is for looping through all the files given, which is basically this form here for file and dollar star. Oops. Do something and then reference dollar file and then say done. When I show you some of the scripts that I have, you'll see that that comes up a few times. All right, and now the last topic we have for bash scripting is using functions. So if I open up this backup.sh, we'll see that this is getting like a bit long now perhaps. And so we might want to break this up potentially into functions. Um, we can do that in bash. The way that you can make a function is similar to how you do it in Python or Java. You would put it somewhere at the top of the script. And so if I want to, let me start with something simpler actually. If I want to make a uh, function that just sort of prints out a message, I would do it like this. I would say like print message, then you put parentheses, and then you do curly braces. So Bash has a mix of different syntactical elements that it has. Um, as we've seen, it doesn't use curly braces to separate if statements or loops. It does for functions. If you have functions, you have curly braces to separate them. And again, the indentation doesn't matter, but I would always intend inside of a function like this. So notice, unlike Java, there's no like return type because Bash doesn't really have types. Everything is a string. And there's no word like def or define or anything like that that some other languages have. Uh, you just have the name of the function followed by parentheses, followed by curly braces. And then I can say something like echo, hello there, something like that. And then what it essentially does is it creates a new command that you can use later down in the script. So we would call this just by saying print message like this. If I run this program now, the script, it should print out hello there. It should print out the message. So if I run bash script.sh, it says hello there because I called the function. Notice you don't put any parentheses to call the function. Uh, you just call it basically like a, a mini command that you've created. And of course, you can call it as many times as you want, and it will run as many times as you call it. Now, it's kind of interesting the way that you pass parameters into these scripts. So just to sort of show you, let's go ahead and put a parameter into this so that instead of saying hello there, it will say hello and then greet you by name. So we'll say, ideally we want to say something like this, hello name. But the way that parameter passing works in, oops, in uh, a function in bash is kind of unusual. We don't actually put them inside of the parentheses like you would think maybe you would if you're used to Python or Java. Instead, what it does is it works basically the same way as if you were passing a parameter into a script in the first place. As we've seen, the command line parameters that we pass into these scripts are done with these $1, $2, $3, variables. And with a function, it works the exact same way. The first parameter into print message is $1, and the second one is $2. So if I say, like, print message Susan, then Susan will be passed into this function as $1. And so if I run this, it will say, hello, Susan. And of course, I can say, hello, Bob as well, and then it will get two print messages, one for Susan and one for Bob. 
Now, notice that, again, Bash is loosey-goosey with types and things like that. You can put these in quotation marks or not. I'd probably put them in quotation marks. It looks a little bit more like we're doing real programming that way, but Bash doesn't actually really care. It's just, it's just text that's being passed around, essentially. So if I print out, like, echo first argument is $1, here, inside of this part of the Bash script, it is going to refer to the overall script's first parameter. So if I run bash.script, the first argument is nothing, and we get hello Susan and hello Bob. If I put cake here, then the first argument is cake into the script, but for the function, dollar $1 refers to Susan or Bob. So when you're inside of a function, your dollar parameters are replaced with new ones. So if I access dollar $1 or dollar star or dollar pound, dollar two, any of them, and I'm in the script overall, then it refers to the arguments that get passed on the command line in the first place when the script was initially invoked. But if I'm inside of a function and I reference any of these things, dollar pound, dollar star, dollar one, it refers to what this function itself was called upon. All right, so that shows how functions can be used. And just like for Python or Java or any other programming language, the main usage of functions is so that you can split up a complicated task into multiple sort of discrete pieces, or if you have something that you're doing over and over again so that you can make it so that you don't have repetitive code, you can sort of make the function once and then call it from multiple locations. So with the rest of this, I wanted to show you some scripts that I use as sort of real day-to-day -day scripts in my daily life. Um, the first one I end up using a lot, it's copy to all. And to understand this script, um, you will have to know how like copy sort of normally works. So if I have many, many directories and I have one file, and I want to put a copy of that file into all of the directories, there's no real built-in way to do that with the copy command. You can say copy all of these files into one directory, but there's no command that says copy this one file into all of these directories. And the reason I use this is when I'm grading stuff, I will have a directory for each student's submission, and I'll want to like copy an input text file into all of the you know, 50 or so potentially directories. And so I have this script copy to all. This is a pretty simple script, but it saves me a lot of time because what it does is it first saves the file. This is the thing that we want to copy into dollar one, and then it does shift. And again, the point of shift is so that we um, sort of take this sort of out of the argument list. Now the file that we want to do the copying, uh, the file that we want to actually copy is in the dollar file variable. And now dollar star is just left with all of the directories we want to put it into. So then I say for each directory in the list of all the rest of the arguments, copy this file into that directory. So again, let's see how this is used. If I make just a whole bunch of little directories, h, i, j, k, something like that. And I want to copy a file, let's say, um, input.txt. And now I want to copy input.txt into all of these directories. We can say uh, dot slash copy to all, input.txt, the name of our file. And then I can do this, star slash. And this says copy it into everything that's a directory. If I just did star, it would have also tried to copy it into copy to all, input.txt, java test, all that, and it wouldn't have really worked that well. But if I say star slash, that says copy it into everything that's a directory. And then if you look at this, all of these directories now have this input.txt. So this one I find is a big time saver for me personally. Uh, that's the thing about scripts is that everybody's use cases will be different. And probably most people don't need to copy a text file into tons of directories all at once, but I do, and so I have a script for it. That's the nice thing about the command line, is you can really tailor it to the way that you are personally sort of doing things. I Let me get rid of these, all these little directories here, and input.txt. The next one I'll show you is this 2SRV. Oops script, which just copies 
some number of files onto my ianfinlayson.net server where I have all this, these things set up. If I'm on just my local computer or my laptop or my office computer and I have a file that I want to send to my server, then rather than have to type the whole SCP command to send the things that I want to send, I have this script that just says for each thing in the list of arguments that I give it, send that thing to ianfinlayson.net. So we do that with the SCP command, which is the secure copy dollar thing references each thing one by one in the loop and send it to ianfinlayson.net on just my home directory. So it just plops it down in my home directory and then from there I can go and put it into, into a different place. I don't run this uh, script on the CPSC server, I run it on my own computer. I just put it here so I can show you. So I won't run that one, that's okay. I have another one that I also run in my office which is called print it. And this one, I want to give it a bunch of files and I want them all to be printed, regardless of what type of file they are. This one I use if I have a bunch of attachments, like if I um, am going to a meeting and there's lots of attachments and things that I need to sort of print and have prepped when I go to the meeting, I will run the print it command and I'll just pass in a bunch, a big long list of documents and I just want them all printed. So print it, I am doing some things. Uh, there's a function in this one, which is called print one. And it says a uh, function to print a file based on its type. And I have a comment, add more someday if I ever need to print other types of things. And this is using a case statement, which we didn't actually talk about. It's sort of like a switch statement in Java or C. It says case of dollar one, our first and only argument that this function is expecting. And then we have in star.pdf. So if this is a PDF file, do this command to print it. Uh, with the LPR command, um, I have put in to say two sides, long edges, so that saves paper on this PDF file. PDF files can be directly printed with the LPR command, not on the CPSC server because there's no printer attached to that, obviously. Otherwise, if it's a doc or a docx, then I make a temporary file. I actually get rid of all, all the temporary files that are in slash temp that are PDF files. Then I use sOffice, which is the command line way you can invoke the LibreOffice Office Office Suite. And I found this online on Stack Overflow, I'm sure, of how uh, to convert on the command line a doc or a docx file into a PDF. And then I send that to the printer. And then I guess just for good measure, I deleted the temporary PDF files that got created. And then if it's anything else, I say, I don't know how to print this thing. I've only used, needed to use this on PDFs and doc files. Uh, any other type of file, I would, it would just fail for. Then the case, funny enough, is ended by ASOC. Um, if statements like we've seen are ended by fee, so if backwards, and case statements are ended with ESOC, which is case backwards. Bash just has some weird stuff about it. I don't know, that's just how you end a case statement. Then I have this. Uh, loop to go through and print everything in the, um, I don't know why I, I did the, the curly braces, it's just one single variable. You uh, definitely didn't need to do that in this case. Uh, I, we did talk about that two weeks ago though. So uh, go through everything in the list of arguments and just print all of the things. So call this function on all of the arguments which are given. That's a helpful one. And then I have only one other script to show you which is a uh, script that I've worked on over a number of years for um, automatically compiling and testing uh, Java source code submissions that students send. This is quite a long script. You can see hundreds of lines. It does all kinds of things. Um, Canvas, when people turn in Java files on Canvas, does a number of weird things uh, such as um, uh, renaming the file so instead of like main.java it'll call it like main-3.java and then sometimes it even has like a, a really even more crazier uh, uh, naming thing where it puts like all these hash numbers into the name I really don't understand why it does that and so there's a number of functions that I have in this this one goes through and gets rid of all of the weird naming things so it replaces spaces with underscores because spaces and file names really don't work um, canvas tags files is late. If they're late, I get rid of that. I don't really care. Um, get rid of the other weird stuff that happens inside of the submissions. Then I make a directory for every submission, uh, doing, doing sort of complicated stuff. I've built this up over the years. 
uh, in Java, if you have package lines and you're com compiling on the command line, it needs to be in a package with that same name. So people who use certain IDEs will have like package.com.company at the top of it, and I need to remove that. So I have this find command to find all the Java files, and then exec this said that replaces the package to the end of the line with nothing. So this uh, stuff comes in handy, these, these various things we've talked about over the semester. Um, do, do, do. Uh, then I have this code to compile all of the code, all of the submissions I have. So for each item in the list of directories that I have here, go through and do this thing. If the item's a directory, so if dash D, this is our one of our checks, this checks if this thing is a directory. So it ignores just regular old files. Then it says compiling this item. So we CD into the item, CD into the directory, run Java C on all the Java files, and then write the output of this compile command and also the errors of this compile command into a file called compile.txt. So I can see all the compile errors in one place. Then I run all the code. So I go through each directory and run the setup test command. Um, setup test is the thing that sort of like goes in and finds with a grep which of your files contains void main and then runs that Java file, uh, putting the output of it into this file called report.txt. Um, I have this command verify commands, which just makes sure um, here I'm using a for loop through this list of commands. These are all the things that the script depends on. If any of these commands are missing, then it won't work. And so we uh, go through each of these programs. For each one, if the command isn't found, then um, print out that we need this program. Please install it and try again and exit one. The big one is rename, which sometimes isn't installed on all systems. Um, and so on. And then down here at the very end, we get this submissions.zip, which is how Canvas gives me the submissions of all the student files. I unzip them and then do all these things, rename the files, make the directories, get rid of the zip files and just unzip them all, cut all the package lines, and then unnest the directories. So if something is like multiple directories deep, I sort of like make it just sort of shallow. Then I compile them all and run them all down at the bottom, which I sometimes comment this out. So this command, this script that I've wrote, written over the couple of years um, saves me numerous hours every week. I don't have to go through and download all the submissions that people give me and go into the directory and compile them all and run them all. It's all sort of taken care of. I can give it input files and it'll download and compile all the code, run all of the programs on the input file, and then put all of the results into one big text file. So I can just go through and it makes um, the, my task of grading a little bit easier. So those are just a few examples ranging from really simple ones like these into sort of a more complicated thing. Uh, I've written other shell scripts over the years. I tend to sort of just whatever things that I need to do now, um, whatever tasks that I have, I will make shell scripts to automate them and make them as simple as possible. So that's all for shell scripts. The uh, thing about shell scripts is that, like I said, they're sort of custom purpose because if there was something that was as generally, if there was something that was widely, widely general, generally used and everybody needed this thing, it would just be one of the commands like grep or find or ps or whatever. But the ability to write shell scripts lets each individual person think, hey, what things am I doing that could be automated? And then you're allowed, you're able to, with shell scripts, to create a script that scratches that one specific itch. I've, over the years, have used a different set of shell scripts. These are just the ones that, right now, I find the most helpful. Um, it is a really helpful thing to be able to do as you're working on software projects. Oftentimes, people will have scripts to like install a program that you're working on or automatically like set up an environment to make sure that everything that you need is installed, those kinds of like system management tasks. If you go into, uh, you know, IT or cybersecurity or system management or anything like that, there's tons of scripting all over the place. It's, it's, it's a very widely used skill in that regard. As a software developer, it is also still useful because we still also as software developers work on systems like this and being able to automate all of the things that are boring and repetitive is super useful. You can do that with multiple different ways. You can do that with writing 
Java or C++ or Python programs, and having shell scripts is sort of like another, another alternative tool. I find that if a task involves interacting with the system a lot, I find shell scripts are easier and more effective. Whereas if the task has sort of minimal interacting with the system and is more like computational, then regular programming languages are better. So it sort of depends on what thing it is that you need to do. But having shell scripting in your arsenal makes you very much a well-rounded uh, computer uh, power user and, and being able to, to use this is a super powerful thing. So that's all for this week. And as we said, this is actually the last week of the semester. And so uh, that is all really for this class, at least the video portion of it. As always, please let me know if you are stuck on anything or have any questions on any of the assignments or quizzes. All right, talk to you guys later, bye.